you can't recover from that. I don't care who you are. Like even the best of us can't recover from it. Oh, I'm gonna write that down. At the end of the day, it's on you. This is good. That's back. Good. Back. Good. Back. Hi, everyone. I'm Jerry Gale, and I am the director of the Music Center Spotlight Program. Today, we're going to focus on acting, and we're going to explore digital audition techniques and really important tools for the actor. With me is my fabulous guest, Miss Carla Renata. And uh, Carla has been in numerous Broadway shows, including uh, Gary Coleman in Avenue Q and her NAACP Theater Award nomination as Shenzi in The Lion King. And she is the only actress to recur in four sitcoms in one episodic season. Not once, but twice. And she is currently on NBC's number one sitcom, Superstore, with Emmy winner America Ferrara. In addition to being the creator and host of The Curvy Critic with Carla Renata, she's also the author of The Actor's Guide to Self-Marketing, um, How to Brand or prom Promote Your Unique Image, and she is a graduate of Howard University. Carla, I love you. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure, Jerry. <laughs> well, I'm really excited. And, and as you know, I reached out to students and parents, actually, to talk about what are the things that were most important to them. And we got a lot of really, really great questions. I just love this first question. It was actually from a mom. It's there is something very electric and scary about walking into an actual audition room, like a live audition, right? There's something that is scary, but it kind of uplifts your performance. So the question was, how do you bring that same kind of electric energy into a this digital box? Like, how do you do that? The good thing about everybody having to do things digitally is that you get to do it as many times as you want, right? So it's a good rule of thumb to just tape it, play it back and see what you like, what you don't like and fix it, do it again and fix it till you get it where you want it. Now you have to be cognizant of the fact that when you do this in real time, you're not gonna have the luxury of doing that. So it's highly advised to be as prepared as possible when you tape it the first time so that you're not taping it 10, 20 times to get it where you want it to go. But short answer to the question is try to rehearse it and get it exactly where you want it to be before you start taping and do realize that even though you have the luxury of doing multiple takes and editing and stuff in the process just do it like you would do it in real time because eventually this is not going to be our normal any longer and we're going to go back to being in a room where, uh, where where we are auditioning in front of people and so you have to be prepared. You just always have to be prepared. Learn those lines as well as you can. Learn those lyrics as well as you can. Perform it in front of somebody, even if you have to do it uh, with a friend or somebody via Zoom. Like just perform it in front of somebody via Zoom. Do it in front of somebody so that you get some semblance of what it's gonna feel like. And then you're just not like out there making bad choices. That is such a great idea to do it on Zoom with somebody there watching you so because that that also brings up that energy a little bit when you're doing a live audition is there anything that you sort of say to yourself before you walk in that room is there anything that kind of goes through your head one thing that goes through my head more so than anything else is that i'm always uber uber nervous and so like lyrics start going away lines start going away and i have to remind myself that this is this is the one day the one minute, two minutes, three minutes, however long it is that I get to show somebody what I'm made of. I might not get to audition for anybody else the rest of that week, the rest of that day, the rest of that month, the rest of that year. But for those two minutes, I get to be the star for those two minutes and I need to walk in that room and own it and be a star and let those nerves work to my advantage as opposed to my detriment because they can work to your detriment. And once that happens, like once you go down that slippery slope of your nerves getting to you and, and you freak out, there's you can't recover from that. I don't care who you are. Like even the best of us can't recover from it. So just yeah. try to find a way to make it work to your advantage as opposed to your detriment. Another question that came in is, 
when you are doing and this is an interesting question okay so when you're doing a show a broadway show when you're re, where you are doing a million shows a week or let's say you are working on a monologue or you're working on a piece of material and because this came from students it would be they'd be working on a monologue and you're working on a monologue over and over and over and over again how do you keep that material fresh how do you keep you know especially for comedy that the timing and everything on a comedic piece but how do you keep the material fresh if you're working on it all the time all the time so in terms of doing it repeatedly for eight shows a week, you don't have the same audience eight shows a week. When you're doing a show eight times a week, it's never the same group of people that are coming to see it. So the response is gonna be different and it's not gonna be in the same place every time. Like sometimes the script is so brilliant that the laughs are kind of built in and you know unequivocally that there's going to be this laugh on this line every single time and you don't even have to think about it but every once in a while there might be a laugh or a response in a place that you didn't ever think there would be a response and it might throw you off but it's all about being present theater is all about being present and being in the moment so that's how you keep it fresh you just stay in the moment that's what it is you stay in that moment whatever that moment is and sometimes like i remember being overseas doing shows for asian audiences or audiences in some parts of germany where over there they are taught not to respond to a performance until the very end so we would be like da 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 and there would be nothing. <laughs> we would be like, oh my God, we suck. We thought we were just horrendous. <laughs> and then the end of the show would roll around and it would be like, <sighs> so just be present, be present. That's how you make it fresh. If you're present and in the moment, because even your energy isn't the same every day. You're not that's performing okay. for the yeah, and it's okay. You're not performing for the same audience and your energy is not gonna be the same every day. There's some days where I would wake up and it was all I could do to roll out of the bed and warm up and get to the train to get on the subway to get to the theater. I just didn't feel like it. And this is what made the difference for me personally. I realized and I was reminded that people work really, really hard sometimes to be able to afford a ticket to come see a Broadway show. That's whether it's in New York, whether it's a touring company, wherever the show is, people work really hard and save their money to see see these shows. And oftentimes those ticket prices are over a hundred dollars. Yeah. So when I go to work, I need to be cognizant of that. And the fact that these people have come to be entertained, they don't care that you don't feel good. They don't care that you're tired. They don't care that you got two shows that day and this matinee is at 10 o'clock in the morning. They do not care. They want to be entertained and it is your job to do so and to honor the fact that these people spent their hard earned money to watch you. That's your job and you owe them that. And so as a young actor, if you're going in, it's really about making a commitment to having it be, you have really, a, it's about a commitment to this is going to be as if it's my first time doing it. The, the character, it, I am expressing my feelings for the first time and you really have to tap into that. Yeah, I was talking to you before we went live to say that I had watched Newsies on Disney Plus because I had missed it in real time when it was playing, even when, it, when the touring company came here to Los Angeles and was playing at the Pantages Theater. I still didn't see it and I had friends in it, but I watched it last night on Disney Plus with my mom. And I'm telling you, Jeremy Jordan, who played the lead of Jack Kelly and Kara Lindsay, who played the lead, these two actors, they were in it to win it. And they had an audience in front of them, but it was still being taped. So I don't know how many times they had to stop and go back and pick up something for filming purposes, but it was fabulous. And I felt like I was in the theater watching them. So it goes to what you were saying about commitment. You have to commit to that character. You have to commit to whatever you have decided that character's life is, what the objectives and the goals are for that person. 
that person that you're creating on the stage and be committed to it. And just like any fully fleshed human being, we all have different flavors and colors to our lives and our personalities that change and um, shift from day to day. So find those moments with the character and that'll help you too, as, as younger people trying to find your way and navigate through building a character and keeping it fresh. What some people may not know is that Carla is a longtime spotlight judge for like 10 years, yeah? It's been longer than that, actually. Yeah. But yeah. Well, so you see, um, and you've been a judge for non-classical voice and also acting. And so concentrating on acting right now, you see a lot of students come in and they bring monologues. And I, and I wonder what kind of advice would you have for students to choose a, a monologue that suits them? Because I'm sure you see a lot of students coming in with pieces that may not be a perfect fit. So how does a young actor go about choosing the right material? The first thing in choosing the right material is that it really needs to be age appropriate. It really needs to be age appropriate. If you are someone that's 16, unless you are a very, very mature 16 year old, doing something from Ma Rainey's Black Bottom may not necessarily be a good choice for you because Ma Rainey has a life and a history and that is so mature and so complicated that at 16 years old, the majority of us don't even understand what that is. And so if you don't understand it, you can't bring it to life on the stage. So first of all, get something that's age appropriate. Secondly, find a piece that has a beginning, a middle and an end. So you mentioned that I'm a spotlight judge, which I am. And in judging a lot of the students that come through the spotlight program, what I consistently see are people taking monologues that are taken out of context of a really famous play or a really famous musical or a really famous movie. They take it out of context for that one or two minutes that they have to perform and out of context, it doesn't work. So you really need to find a piece that has a beginning, a middle and an end. It should not be coming from a musical because there are no monologues in musicals. Every spoken piece in a musical is leading up to a song. So there's that. If you're doing something from a play, you have to pick a piece in the play that is a monologue within the play that if it stood by itself, it still had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it told a story, right? And then thirdly, you need to pick something where you can bring this character to life. Break down the beats, find an objective. What is what is this person's purpose in telling this story? Why are they telling this story? What happened to them before they told the story? What's gonna happen to them after they told the story? And what's happening during? What emotional life are they living during? And make sure whatever that emotional life that you tap into during the course of that piece, it's coming from an organic, real place. There is nothing worse than watching somebody trying to drudge up some tears and just because they think it's going to be effective and, and somebody's going to think, oh my God, they were a fabulous actor because they, they shed a tear. Mm -mm. If it's not organic, I don't care that you shed a tear. It makes no difference to me. The ones, the ones that came in the room that impressed me personally, that made me feel something, were the ones that were completely 1000% committed to the material that had a beginning, a middle and end story and they were very crystal clear about who this character was and what they were doing. There's nothing worse than you not knowing what you're doing. Acting is hard yeah. because acting is basically reimagining and reenacting life, someone else's life that is not your own. So when you read these monologues or these pieces and you feel like you don't connect to it, I suggest you move on to something else. I don't know of any monologue books that are good with that, but there we got nothing but time right now. There are so many plays out there that you could read. And a lot of the play, there's a lot of plays that have been on Broadway that are great plays by wonderful playwrights, new playwrights, old playwrights. There's so many different pieces of material out there for you to discover, but find something that resonates with you. And back, let me just flip back real quick on the age appropriate comment. Uh -huh. Something may not be age appropriate, but it, you may resonate with it. So if you resonate with it, even though it may not necessarily be age appropriate, you can still do it. There was a young lady, Jerry, what was the young lady's name who did, uh, who was in the finals, who did that piece? Kyla? Yes. She is a perfect example of somebody that came in with a piece 
that wasn't necessarily age appropriate for her, but she connected with it. And she knew how to make us connect with her performing it. Yeah. And that's that's what I mean. If you have a connection, then we'll have a connection, but have a connection. Yeah, a hundred percent. When you look at because you you also view the digital tapes as well as live performances. So when you look at a digital tape, when a student sends in a monologue that they're doing on in a digital format, what do you are there things that stand out to you and that are good and things that stand out? Oh, I wish they would have filmed it this way. I wish they would have done that. Can you, can you think of any of those things? So I'll, I'll start with the not so wonderful things first, because that's easy to address. Right. The biggest thing about doing something digitally is that your lighting and your background has got, and your sound has got to be right. I can't cannot stress it enough. Yeah. If you are taping in front of some blinds, if you are taping in front of a brick wall, if you are taping in a room where there's blinds and there's light that's, that's blowing your face out, that's not good. If you are taping something where you're really far away from the phone or the tripod or whatever your setup is, that's not good because we can't hear yeah. you. You can get a lavalier mic that plugs into a cell phone for $20 on amazon.com. Oh, I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> I could actually go, oh, I should have brought it in here. It's called purple something or another, but it literally, it has different um, plugins for an iPhone. You plug it in, you clip it onto your, your lapel, and you talk. And it's as good as you having a boom mic or, or any mic on your phone. They even have mics that you can, big old mics like about this big that you can plug into the bottom of the phone that, in, that are facing you. So if your phone is like this, you can put the, plug the mic in so that it's facing you like that and it'll pick you up. That's right? so great. It's a unidirectional mic, which means it picks up in one direction. It won't pick up sound over here. It won't pick up sound over there. It'll only pick out pick up sound that's coming from the direction from which the person is speaking. Okay. And I know people are like, unidirectional, omnidirectional. What does that mean? So I do sound. So I'm like, and I learned that stuff when I was in college. <laughs> that's the only reason why I know. But yeah, if you get a mic, that helps us hear you. Because a lot of times, and that's another thing, projection. You, Whether you have a mic or not, you have to project. Your enunciation has to be crystal clear. I need to understand what you're saying. If I don't understand you, I can't hear the story. I can't get invested if I can't understand what you're saying. If you're softening your voice for dramatic purposes, don't do that this is and you have to keep in mind also that whoever moves on in the spotlight process is performing in the disney concert hall or they were up until you know COVID 19 hit so we're also looking at people who can project who can command the performance of a room if you can't command a performance in a room with three or four people and you can't command a performance on a digital platform how are you gonna how are you gonna navigate in the real world you have to think about that. In front of 3,000 people. Exactly. You have to think about that. So those are the things that immediately stand out is something that's just like, uh. And then when you edit your, your piece to be sent in, cut off the front part, cut off the back part so that we don't see you turning on the camera. We don't see you turning off the camera. We don't see you making comments. We don't hear other people making comments. We don't need to see all of that. We just want to see you do your performance and see you do your best. We're rooting for you. We want you to be fantabulous. We really, really do. There's nothing that gives me greater pleasure than watching someone that's great. So that's that's the not so good part. The good part about it is when I'm watching someone, what I look for that and what resonates with me is somebody, oh, let me just say this real quick too. I don't need to see this before a monologue either. I don't need to see that. I don't need to see you preparing for 20 seconds <laughs> before you open your mouth. Oh, so it's okay if you prepare for 20 seconds, but edit that out so that we're- Yes, just if you're doing that, cool, do that. But I don't need to see you doing that on tape because I'm like, they gonna start? What's the, what time? Uh, where, where's the, where's the, did I miss it? Is okay. something wrong? And I'm going, is something wrong with the sound? What's happening? Okay. <laughs> what is going on? Okay, note to everybody, listen to Andy Carla. 
I don't need to see that. I really okay. don't. And in the and PS and FYI, in the real world, if you were at an audition and you did that, they would be done. The minute you did that, it would be over. If you took I can understand some people need that time. They just need to take a breath. Do just that. Take a breath. I don't need to see you for there was one person that I watched on tape that literally for 25 to 30 seconds was like this. That's a long time, people. I'm like, that cuts, and that cuts in, and P.S. and FYI, that cuts into your audition time. If yeah. Jerry says the audition time is two minutes, guess what happens when you start doing your monologue? It gets cut off at one minute and 30 because you spent 30 seconds preparing on tape. I'm just saying. Don't yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good idea. You know, film, you got you can film this over and over and over again and then edit that part out. You know, just go cut right it into it. Out, just go click it and cut yeah. it out. So what or we if look you for you don't want to edit out at least, you know, take put if you want to put your head down, that's fine. But take one or you know, two seconds and then be present. And or whoever is taping, if you're taping yourself, that's fine. If somebody's taping you, have them count you in. So that you can use, you know, this. That's a great idea. To, to give you the five seconds or have them do like this. You know, whatever you need to somebody to do. But I don't need to see that. The second thing is what we look for is we look for someone, like I said earlier, to be present, to be completely connected with the material. Someone whose enunciation and articulation are crystal clear. Sometimes a lot of people tell you not to look in the camera. It depends on what your monologue is. If your monologue is a monologue that has you talking to someone, then look right in the camera. Oh, okay. If, look right in the camera and talk. If you're, if whoever you're reading with is uh, is reading with you, have them read like just a little bit off to the side, not way over here, because when you do that, guess what? You're in profile, and then we watch in profile acting. I need to see. As much just as a facing. little bit to the right or the left, just of like the land, just like right? this, yeah. like this. Yeah. This is front. Yeah. And this is just a little bit to the side, yeah. right? Yeah. I see a lot of this. I see a lot of people doing this. That's not good, people. I see a lot of people doing this. And when you do that, when you act in profile, guess what? The sound goes over there, so then I can't hear you. I see people. <laughs> I see people sitting on the floor, starting their monologues. There was one person that was in a bed one time. I'm like, come on now, y'all. But be present, know your lines, know your lines, and say them as effectively and as articulate as you possibly can. Make sure that you break up your beats very effectively. Make sure you know what your objectives are. Make sure that you know who this person is from beginning to end is what gives you a performance. If you've watched any performance ever from some of the greatest, like the Denzel Washingtons or the Meryl Streeps or the Viola Davises or the even somebody that's old, old, old school like Jack Lemon, if you watch any of those people, you will notice that they are themselves in every single piece that they do, but the characters are different and the circumstances that the characters are in are different. Yeah. And so they make themselves amenable to what the situation is. You cannot be a character and not bring a part of you to it. That's what makes it special. That's what makes people want to watch you because exactly. they're watching you yeah. inhabit someone that's great, someone that's complicated, someone that's funny, you know? It's a very difficult line to straddle. I know it is. And I know that some people that are watching this are going to be looking at the screen going, what is she talking about? No. But I, I know they are, but I promise you. I everything. Think so. Is, I think you've been extremely clear about it. Oh, good. But no, really, I it's do. It's so intricate, though. Acting is very, very intricate. Comedy is even worse. When we have people that are doing comedic pieces, don't do it for the laughs. Don't don't do it and try to get just let me get to this funny part because they're really gonna think this is funny. When someone is funny, they're funny. They don't have to try to be. They already are. If somebody is a great dramatic actress, they don't have to shed a tear to do that. They're already a, a great dramatic actress because they're present, which brings right. me back to what I've I consistently keep saying. You have to be present. Yeah. You have to be present. So the good things that we see are the people that are prepared. Yep that are not
doing extraneous things at the beginning and the end of their pieces. They have a beginning, middle, and end to their pieces. It's a very strong, well thought out character, the way they've attacked it. The ones that we kind of go, uh, and, I, and truth be told, I watch every single tape all the way through, sometimes multiple times, because sometimes I, just like when you watch a movie, sometimes you'll watch a movie multiple times because you're like, oh, dag, I missed this part. Let me watch it again so I can see what happened during this part. It's the same thing when I watch somebody do a monologue. I will, if now that we do it digitally, I have the, the luxury of being able to watch it a first, second, or third time. And I will, I will back it up and I will watch it and I will look at their face and I will see if they're present. I will see what their mouth is doing, what their face is doing. Don't be extraneous. I, I'm one of those people, I talk with my hands all the time. My hands are always flying all over the place. You know. But when you're acting sometimes, that can be really distracting or Laugh slapping. More. Slapping, slapping your thighs or slapping stuff is really distracting. Try to do as less as physically possible. I'm not saying, saying stand there stoic like a statue and act. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to be mindful of what your body is doing. If you're somebody whose hands go flying all over the place, have something with some pockets in it and just put your hands in your pockets and let them live there. If you're somebody that doesn't necessarily know what to do with your hands, put your hands in your pocket. Don't do this. Don't do this. <laughs> you know, just yeah. be creative with it. And it brings me back again to saying, watch what you're doing on the tape. Go back and watch yourself. There's right. nothing wrong with you. Some people don't like watching themselves. It makes them cringe. I don't like watching myself either. But the reality of the situation is, you know you better than anybody else, right? So you know what makes you look stupid and you know what doesn't make you look stupid. So if you're watching yourself, you're like, ooh, that was not a good look for me. Let me try something else. And you know? I also think your energy dissipates when you're moving around a lot. It's like there's a, a great process, even as in the rehearsal process, if you, you know, be calm and just, and you know, the feelings might, you might feel differently about the character if you rehearse not moving around a lot, you know, and see what comes out. Now suddenly the energy is not going through your hands, it's coming through your voice, it's coming through your eyes, it's coming through the energy of what you're portraying, the character. So I think it's a good exercise to, to do that anyway. And that's another point I wanna to make too. I know a lot of the kids, they have drama teachers and sometimes what we may suggest to them is in complete contrast to what their teachers are telling them or their family members or their boyfriend or their best friend or whoever is trying to help them. At the end of the day, it's on you. And at the end of the day, it's gonna to have to be your choice and what's gonna make you look your best. And there's a way to find a middle ground between all of these opinions. But at the end of the day, you have to resonate with, with what is going to make the best performance for you. Perfectly said and a great way to end our session today. Carla, I am so thankful and grateful that you were able to join us in your very, very busy schedule. <laughs> so thank you so much. And, and if any of you have questions, you can always email me at spotlight at musiccenter.org and I'm sure it'll be written somewhere. I'm not sure where, but anyway, Carla, I w I'm virtually hugging you. I love and adore you. Thank you so much. You're the, the best, the best, the best. Uh, it's my pleasure always. You know I got you. <laughs> we love you. Thank you. Okay, people, that's a wrap. But while you're still here, <laughs> hit and like those subscribe buttons and talk to us in the comments below about what other performing arts training topics you'd like us to cover. You might just see your suggestions in a future episode, you never know. Learn more about the Spotlight program at the Music Center offstage at our website, musiccenter.org. Thanks for watching. <laughs>